Hello, friends. Welcome to the ATC Double Cut. My name is Micah Woods, and in this episode, I have a very special guest. It is Dr. Chaz Schmid, who is the assistant professor now and a senior researcher in the horticulture department at Oregon State University. Welcome to the show, Chaz. Thanks, Micah. Thanks for having me. It it is so cool that we can finally get the schedule. We've been <laughs> trying for uh, a few weeks, maybe a month, to to fit it in between the time zones and both of our schedules. And uh, I'm so interested to talk with you because somebody told me that sometimes I have people on the show when I have guests, and they said sometimes they just they're just like agreeing with me all the time and like, yep, you know, or or that's right. And, and they say, you should use, you, you know, the, the conversations are more interesting and it's just more fun to listen to if you get people where you, where you can disagree about some kind of topic. And then I thought, wow, Chaz would be great to have on because he's often been doing research that seems to contradict or prove wrong something that that maybe I'm known for or something that I have um, advocated for or something that I've explained. I, I don't think it's quite like that, but I'm going to try to bring that out a little bit. Um, and this being the ATC double cut, let's kick it off uh, with a blog post. Uh, and so I'm going to put a link to all the, all the articles or blog posts that, uh, I discuss here in this show. I'll go ahead and put a link to it in the show notes. The first blog post, or the one that we'll, we'll use to kick off the conversation, is uh, one from a few years ago called Updated Spreadsheets for Sand Top Dressing by GP. And this refers to an article that you wrote, Chaz, uh, with some of your master's research, I think, at uh, University of Nebraska. And so uh, if I scroll down there, I just, I think that I'm using GP to recommend a certain amount of top dressing. And it was linked to James Hempfling's sand top dressing amounts that were used at Rutgers. And also in the list that I show here, you found uh, the greens receiving an annual sand top dressing rate of 20.3 cubic feet per thousand square feet, which is about six millimeters in depth, were consistently at 3.3 or less percent soil organic matter in the top three inches. So that was your survey article. What was the title of that one? Uh, oh, and <sighs> organic matter concentration of creeping bent grass, putting greens and resident management impact or something like that. Correct. And that, that I think was one of the first times that I, became aware of, or I started paying attention to your research back then. Yeah, so that was some work I did with uh, Rock, and we traveled all over the country, or I traveled all over the country and sampled putting greens for organic matter. And um, as you're probably well aware, our, our sampling procedures have, have changed a little bit since then. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are shifting and moving towards the OM246 kind of sampling procedure. So these numbers are probably um, not what you'd expect, at least in the upper two, two layers that you're sampling there. Um, but it was interesting that there was a couple main things that really stuck out as being important in the survey and top dressing rate was one of those. Um, and so it was interesting doing the survey work and talking to superintendents and, and trying to get a gauge on how much um, sand was actually applied on golf courses. Um, and so that's kind of our first attempt at coming up with a number for uh, an annual rate. And most of our survey was um, the northern U.S. So I spent most of my time in Nebraska, South Dakota, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. I did a little trip to um uh, to Washington and then east as well over towards Chicago. So that was kind of the bulk of my sampling in the bent grass territory of the upper Midwest, um, where they tended to top dress quite a bit. So and and the, so there's something that really stood out to me because that already that already was a little bit contradicting something that I'd been recommending. 
the USGA green section um, had been recommending, I think based on some of Dr. Caro's research, which was in the Southeast, um, they'd been recommending uh, from 40 cubic feet per thousand square feet per year up to 50 cubic feet per thousand square feet, which in the depth units that I like to use, that is from 12 to 15 millimeters per year. And then you had this survey that was nationwide and you proposed the number of that's half the low rate that the USGA green section was recommending at the time. Of course, I had, I had loved having that recommendation from the USGA and I hadn't ever done any research on it. I hadn't ever thought that well i mean i'd thought about it but i hadn't done any research on it and i just thought here's a definitive number from the usga saying if you want to manage organic matter successfully then you should be having this amount of sand applied so i was recommending from 12 to 15 millimeters and then you had that paper that came out and said you know maybe six millimeters per year is a good rate so that was that was did were you aware at the time that you published that that it was a number that was half the kind of the standard recommendation um i I don't think i did i think i was a little naive at that time and didn't didn't realize um i mean i knew there were some recommendations obviously for organic matter percentages and that was kind of below that three and a half or three percent there is was the target um but I didn't really look at those kind of Southeast recommendations for, for top dressing in comparison. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to hear that. Yeah. It's, well, it's, it's interesting for me because then I take things like the pace turf growth potential model and then try to, to fit it to say, okay, if, if we have probably about this much growth in a certain part of the country, and if this is the standard amount of sand to apply, then, uh, how does that work out on a weekly or a monthly basis based on what your growing season would be? So like saying, you know, so basically if we'd compare like, uh, you know, Atlanta to Chicago or something, they have different growing seasons, uh, different amounts of growth. So you'd expect maybe that there'd be different, uh, sand top dressing rates. So it was very interesting to me that, that you, um, that you did that. And that's turned out to be uh, it's had a big impact on me, uh, because it got me, maybe I was already starting to think that maybe a little bit less sand <laughs> than I was recommending might work. And, uh, you know, now I'm even go beyond that to where I think you can do about half of, of that number. Like you, you were saying 20, uh, cubic feet was the results from your survey, but that's, that was kind of like MLSN. It wasn't an experiment. It was a, observational study and the data analysis on on what was really happening which can be quite informative maybe even more so sometimes than controlled experiments um so yeah that was that was cool yeah it's uh it you can get a lot of data you can get a broad set over you know uh, um, a lot of geographic area um but you're kind of left to the mer mercy of the you know, the survey taker or the people actually completing the survey that they have good records and they know exactly how much sand they're putting down. And so there's a lot of things um, that went into the survey. So as long as, you know, it took a lot of kind of handholding and making sure they fill out the survey and help them do some calculations on, on sand. So I got really familiar with how much was in a load of sand. And if you got the pup trailer, how much more was on top of that. And then we could do some calculations, um, but they can be very informative. Um, Sometimes our colleagues don't like them to be published in the peer reviewed literature and they can have difficulty getting through. I think I submitted that three or four times before it actually got published. So, um, but it got through finally, thankfully. So. That's, yeah, it's good. It's, it's good to have that number there. And I think, yeah, sometimes the stuff that's a little bit different turns out to be harder to publish, but it's the, the stuff that should be, <laughs> that, that really needs to get out there. Uh, yeah. so, um, so th after you've you finished your master's project about organic matter and sand top dressing and i i saw you did something with infiltration rate also but it was it was kind of like that for your masters right yeah so we did um some work we did it was a short-term study so that was one of the 
the limitations you see a lot of organic matter work is done by master students and they have you know two to three summers of research and then they kind of um, finish the study and move on so it was kind of a standard master's project where i looked at hollow time versus solid time over a two-year period and then we looked at um, different um, venting or kind of needle time treatments during the midsummer that we put down monthly. So we made three applications, one in June, one in July, and one in August. And so we looked at needle tines and kind of that quad tine setup. We looked at the planet air system. Uh, we looked at the hydroject and we looked at bayonet tines as kind of those monthly treatments. And then we looked at organic matter and we looked at infiltration rate on those plots. Um, and we didn't see a huge difference in infiltration rate between hollow time versus solid time in that short time frame, um, which is, some of what I was seeing early on in the, the current trials that we're doing. Um, and we did see some, some benefits from using some of those venting treatments as people would call them now um, during midsummer. So the hydrogen was particularly helpful for improving infiltration rates. That was far and above um, the best treatment. And I know there's some significant limitations with that equipment, um, but the 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 people or the superintendents that that use that swear by them and usually have six or eight of them behind their their maintenance shop to to keep them running um mm -hmm. yeah that, but, but we didn't see a, a big difference in organic matter or infiltration in that kind of short period of time and um so let's let's skip the potassium and anthracnose and winter kill and, and cover that last and mm -hmm. let's transition now to the long term you mentioned that was a short term two year mm -hmm. project and you, now you're i guess maybe three years into what's like initially a five-year project at oregon state university looking at a hundred percent poa annua putting green on a sand root zone and you're looking at top dressing and cultivation practices right and, Correct. and then you're assessing assessing turf grass quality and it's and i i've been uh this morning i'm i'm recording this it's morning in in thailand uh your afternoon so um i looked at the 2022 field day report i think or maybe it was the i, I think it was the 2022 field day report um and and last week I looked at the USGA update about it. So it, it seems to me that the results have been pretty clear so far. Could you, could you describe the treatments and what you've seen so far? Yeah. And if you don't mind, I may share a couple slides here. I've got some treatment you, set up and some of the data. Oh, you bet. Yeah. You can, uh, you can share your screen and, then I will pop it up on. So once you share it, then I can put it here. And okay. uh, so some people are going to be watching this jazz, but some people are just listening. So okay. for the people listening, you can, you can see this on the video, but I will just uh, encourage you as you describe what you're seeing to imagine that some people can't see it. Um, okay. So, so here I've brought up on the screen, uh, the slide. Thank you for putting this together. This is this is really cool. Yeah, no problem. Um, so we'll just kind of start out going through the treatments. So the the trial is actually a two by three by uh, let's see two factorial. So we have um, two different tine types. So we have hollow tine and solid tine. And I've got a picture on the screen uh, after the treatments are done. So it's it's pretty obvious why. A lot of superintendents favor the solid tine over hollow tine, just the kind of the disturbance to the surface and all the, the debris left over after uh, core cultivation. And then we also have a cultivation timing factor in there as well. So both the hollow tine and solid tine get applied at all three factors. So we have a, a spring only treatment, a fall only treatment and then a combination of both spring and fall. So twice a year. So the question is, can we get away with once a year? Uh, and if we do, can we, you know, do we have, does it have to be hollow time or solid time and which season should we emphasize that in? So that's kind of the first question there, the time type and timing. And then the second factor is our, our sand top dressing rate. So we have two rates, the 50, or 100 pounds per thousand on the top there and the 50 pounds per thousand. And so this is applied biweekly through the summer. Uh, we usually get six to seven uh, top dressings in during the summer. 
So um, I, I want to I want to interject here um, and clarify about the rates. Are those annual rates of sand or are those so the, per application are, rates? Per application. So 100 pounds per thousand, which is about two cubic feet per thousand, I think is the conversion. So it's two and one cubic foot. And so these numbers came oh. from um, okay. James Hemphling and Rennie Wong's uh, research. Um, looking at some sand top dressing and anthracnose on annual bluegrass turf. So, so Rennie looked at 50, 100, and I think she had up to 150 pounds per thousand in her treatment during the summer. And the higher rate, you, you begin to accumulate sand at the surface when she hit about August. And so it becomes too high of a rate. You either end up mowing a lot off or you kind of have to back off to that 100 pound rate. Um, which is one of the limitations of research when you have to pick a rate and kind of stick to it. Um, but that's the reason why we chose the hundred pound and 50 pound per thousand rate. And you can see it here on the, on the left is non brushed. Just to give you an example, the, the 50 pound is really light. The hundred pound is a little bit heavier. Uh, once it's brushed in, it's, you can barely see either of them on the surface here. Okay. That's great. I, I tried to translate this into millimeters this morning, and I may have made a mistake because the low rate of 50 pounds per thousand square feet, I, I came up with 1.5 millimeters, which, which is absurdly high for, a for like a light top dressing. So, so let me just try to figure this in my head. If we have 50 pounds, that's 22.7 kilograms, right? Because a kilogram is more than a pound. So it's, right, so that part's right. So it's, it's 22, let's say we have 22 kilograms over 1,000 square feet, and 1,000 square feet is 92.9 square meters. So we have 22 kilograms divided by... 92.9 square meters and at that point i got like 0 0.24 kilograms per square meter uh i i was off by a thousand i i got it i i took 0.24 kilograms and i said that's 2400 grams which it's not okay. it's 240 grams so i i i made a mistake so okay now now i recognize my error so rather than being 1.5 millimeters it was 0.15 millimeters would be the low rate and rather than 3 millimeters for the high rate that would be 0.3 millimeters okay I've corrected my mistake. Okay. <laughs> so, so, okay. So you're showing these rates. Tell me, you said six or seven times during the summer. What yeah, does it so, work out to on an annual basis? So annually uh, in cubic feet, if, if you want to go by that, we're, we're probably putting out somewhere uh, at the high rate, um, six to 700 pounds, which is somewhere around 14 to 16 cubic feet per thousand. And then the low rate would be half of that. We're also putting some more on when we're coring and um, top dressing. So if I have a spring treatment where I'm coring it, I'll core, backfill, and then I'll leave a, a, a fairly heavy layer at the surface. So maybe slightly more than this 100 pounds per thousand treatment. And then when I'm not top dressing or not coring, excuse me. So if it's a fall only treatment, I'll apply a top dressing in replacement of that coring treatment. So it is getting some kind of spring top dressing going into uh, the season. So I'm not completely ignoring that. So um, they're getting another probably 200 pounds per thousand, all the treatments that receive top dressing and coring kind of in the shoulder seasons during coring as well. So the total would be anywhere from 16 to 18 cubic feet at the high rate, the low rates probably anywhere from eight to 10 cubic feet per year. Okay. So, um, that, that is perfect. That's that, that number is very interesting. So your high rate is, is something that is about what you said 20, right? It was 20 cubic feet. 
yep. was from your master's study. So now you've also have a treatment that's about half that, which would be the eight to 10. Okay. I, yep. I got it. So, and, and I, so, so let me just translate that real quick into millimeters. So let's just say we're five to six millimeters annual at the high rate. And we're about three millimeters at the, at the low rate. Awesome. Go ahead, Chaz. Yeah. And I was going to say, I think the one big difference is we're, you know, this one's POA. And then, you know, the, the previous study, I tried to mostly focus on bent grass or mix of POA and bent grass together. Um, and so maybe you'd argue that you get a little bit more growth on bent grass in the summer and you can get a little bit more sand down on those. Um, but I, I think that's pretty close. That's, it's a pretty good number, a pretty good target to shoot for. If you can get up to that 20 cubic feet, I think you're doing pretty good. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, a good goal to shoot for. So, all right. All right. Should we, we'll jump into a few results. I've got a, a few results and a few pictures to show, and then um, we can kind of uh, discuss, feel free to stop me wherever. Um, so the, briefly the data collection. Um, so we're doing OM246 on this. So we are segmenting it up um, down to the 60 millimeters or six millimeter or six centimeters. We're doing double ring infiltration. So here's the infiltrometer we use. It's a 12 inch outside diameter, six inch inside diameter. Uh, and then we're using several different tools to measure surface firmness. So we've got the spectrum, uh, true firm. We've also got a Clegg and I just recently got a GS3 to use on the trial and kind of experiment with. So the first thing is, and I think this is probably why most superintendents besides the cleanup and the, and the, the hours that go into coring is the recovery time. So we're seeing almost half the amount of coring. I see I have an animation built in here if you just ignore that, but uh, about half the amount of time to recover from coring damage. So this was in the spring of 2021, we got recovery in about eight days compared to uh, the hollow time treatment that took about 15 to 16 days to recover from coring. And I was just seeing that in the plots today, our, our solid time treatments have already recovered from our, our fall, fall cultivation um, and our hollow times are still kind of lingering open here and we're about uh, a little over two weeks out from, from coring. And then this is the one that I think if people have solid tined a, a fair amount in their career, they start to realize they use more sand. And so we've been seeing this pretty consistently. If we have dry conditions and we, um, we, we get fairly decent holes, we get more sand in our solid tine holes than we do our, our hollow tine holes. So something to think about if you are doing solid tine and you're gonna have to order more sand. So gallons, just some gallons per 80 square feet. That yeah. is the best unit I've ever <laughs> seen. So that's my plot. So that's how many gallons go on to each one of those plots that they take <laughs> up. So that's quick and yeah. dirty uh, figures. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's easy. Yeah, yeah, that's easy when you're doing the research. I I like depth. I I don't let's let me just interject. Do you do you does depth make any sense to you or do you do you prefer volume per area? Uh I like volume per area or even weight. The reason I go with weight is because if you just throw a piece of plywood out, you measure the area of the plywood that you're you're covering and then you just sweep it up and weigh it. So that's that's why I've been relating a lot of my sand top to in rates back and wait just so they can easily calculate their rate and compare back to it um, if you go over a tarp or we used to use a, a piece of plywood with our uh, with our drop spreader so yeah that's I, I i recommend that people measure what their actual exact application rates are because you're just talking about uh in the previous slide that you showed you're you're showing the uh the disruption that the time to recovery and it's it's not only holes that uh, that have time to recovery, but if there's too much sand on the surface, that's also time you know some extra days of disruption. So knowing exactly how much sand and how long it takes for the grass to come back to the desired conditions uh, is something that can be optimized. So I, I how you, and and also to manage the organic matter, you have to put the right amount of sand, and so. It, uh, just knowing exactly how much you're putting out in, in, in the exact rate, uh, is, is good. Now I, I measure it by weight, but then I like to communicate it in depth because I just find it, 
it's easier to do this internationally or, you know, I mean, even from Oregon to Idaho or something, if you get rid of the denominator, because if one person's talking about thousand square feet, the other person's talking about acre, it, it, it's difficult to make that conversion. But if you, if everybody's just talking about depth, 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 then you, you get rid of the, um, the denominator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, make it the easiest as possible so it's kind of universal across i think that would that would simplify it 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 is difficult to measure that depth or kind of quantify it um but you know and without doing the conversion yeah right so this involves an assumption of a couple things number one your sand should be dry um so so if you measure your mass when it's dry then you know the bulk density of sand is generally going to be from 1.5 to 1.65 something like that mm -hmm. so you can either measure that you can look at what your lab test is for the bulk density of the sand or you can just assume that it's it's 1.56 or if you want to you can assume that it's 1.63 i've used both numbers i've measured it on dry sand also you can if it's dry you can put it in a graduated cylinder and you know okay here's 400 grams of sand and it just happens to have a mass of 250, uh, sorry, it has a volume of 253 milliliters that you measure in a graduated cylinder, and then you know what your bulk density is. But um, yeah, that's, it's an extra step, but maybe, maybe someday in the future, that will be a standard thing to do. Yeah, you know it's complicated when you have a whole separate Excel file to convert between, you know, <laughs> your pounds per <laughs> thousand square feet to cubic feet per thousand. You know, it, it, it it's pretty bad. So, yeah, well, you can see the mistake that I just made this morning because I, I'm not so familiar with pounds per thousand square feet, and like the cubic feet per thousand square feet, I can sort of do in my head because I've I've seen that reported so many times that I know that 12, uh, sorry, uh, 40 cubic feet per thousand square feet, I know is 12 millimeters. And si six millimeters is 20 cubic feet per thousand. But then when it's pounds, I, I made a unforced error at, at 4.45 in the morning, which <laughs> I, I hope everybody will forgive me for. <laughs> Understand. All right, all right. Yeah, so, so this is really interesting. Uh, the solid tine, this is, uh, are you putting the sand before you solid tine or after? After. So we're, we're cleaning it up. And then basically what I do is I dump, uh, three gallons, four gallons on one end of the plot. And then we hand broom across, um, and then pick up any leftover sand at the, the end of the plot or fill back in. So, um, we're doing all hand brushing and I, I keep the surface pretty clean. So I don't leave a lot left on the surface after we're done. So we get a pretty pretty accurate estimate. And then we hand shovel and, and do a lot of brushing and blowing to get all the cores off and try to get as much sand or cores out of the holes and, and backfill it with clean sand. But obviously you do lose the bottom of the core back into the hole. And you know I think the quantity mm -hmm. of sand or the difference between hollow tine and solid tine really you know, moisture has a big impact, but also rooting and the, the depth of the core you're pulling. I've seen, you know, years where we've had a lot of stress and, and poor rooting and we just pull poor cores and we can't get a lot mm -hmm. of sand in the holes. So. Yeah, I have I saw that this year at one place. I was like, okay, let's go ahead and core. That'll be great. And then when you actually run the machine across the green, it didn't make the holes the way I imagined them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm looking at that and that, that's looks like a difference between like four to 5.5 or something. So yeah. that's like a 25%, 30% difference. Is, is that about the magnitude difference that you're seeing? Yeah, that's kind of what I've been hearing as feedback when I've, I've given this presentation a couple times this fall and, and, you know, the, the turf managers in our area kind of agree with that about 25% extra in sand they have to order when they're, when they're solid tining versus hollow tining. And so our tines are exactly the same outside diameter here. So they're both 0.6 inches in outside diameter. Um, and forgive me, my inch uh, conversion to the metric system is not as good as my, my pounds. <laughs> um, that's, that's all right. Um, all right. So, 
so clearly the solid pine can can get more sand into this the root zone that's very good yep okay so i'll move on um so we we started seeing and actually i'm going to get out of here that i think there's some animations in here that i'm going to just uh clear out and then that won't uh, bother me anymore all right so we started seeing this kind of trend in turf quality differences fairly early this actually started popping up in the second year of no coring which is 2021 here. We're, we're in our fourth year, just finished our fourth year of this trial. And you can see about midsummer, we start to see a pretty significant decline. It usually happens around mid July when we start to get hotter temperatures and we see a decline in turf quality in the untreated plots. And you know, almost every year by cl like clockwork, August 1st, the cyanobacteria jumps on these uh, the non-treated plots, the, the heavy organic matter plots, and it, and it doesn't really show up anywhere else. So the other plot on the, the right-hand side of the screen is a solid tine in the spring, and that's at the high rate of sand, so our 100 pounds per thousand. And it's, it's pretty clean. And we do spray some fungicides to control disease on here. Typically what I'll do is I'll let a little bit of disease move in, rate it, and then spray disease. Um, I do control for microdochium, though, just because it can really – cover the entire trial. So I, I am preventively spraying for microdochium on these trials. So this this is pretty consistent. Um, we see this in the non-treated and in some of our top dressing only treatments as well. And yeah, that's right. So that's different than what I would see on bent grass. You're familiar with the the stuff Chris Tritabaugh has been sharing uh, and and writing about where he can just go through the entire summer. He can go May, June, July, August, September without putting sand and not, not have issues. But of course that's, that's bent grass. So yeah, yeah Poa is a different it, animal. Apparently. Yeah. And this was really the, the, the second year you started to see this and, and our, our greens were not, um, perfect starting. I would say they were probably moderately thatchy. They weren't terrible, but they weren't, um, you know, championship condition that are just, you know, firm as a rock. Um, but they were, they were moderately thatchy. And so I think that's why we saw it fairly quickly after two years. Um, but I think some of the pictures here will kind of show <laughs> what we're seeing. So th these are some cores that we took, uh, they're inch and a quarter cores. So they, they are actually, larger cores and and from one of the images i have i'm actually able to see this mat layer it's not even a, a or excuse me this thatch layer at the surface uh is about two centimeters thick so this is after three years uh we saw this this was in 2022 when i took these photos and this is our non-treated control and so, so that's we no no sand no solid time no hollow time correct just, just growing grass and that's the correct. absolute worst treatment uh at almost every rating date. Correct. Correct. Yeah. And so, and you can really feel it. I mean, you feel the surface when you're walking and changing plots, you can feel it's really spongy and, and, and the profile kind of backs that up. So we can, we can definitely grow some thatch out here. Um, we, we do grow grass 12 months out of the year and, and, and are mowing most of the season out here. So we can accumulate quite a bit of organic matter <laughs> in turn. Uh, and, and so here's, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay, yeah, let's go ahead and show and describe the next couple of images. And then then I'm going to ask a question about what would happen if if you would cut the nitrogen rate. Okay, um, yeah. But but yeah, go ahead and show the, the, the profiles here and the different amounts of thatch, mat, and so on. Yep, it's, it, that sounds good. So this is our hollow time spring and fall with our 100, 100 pounds of sand per thousand. So this is our most intensive treatment. You can see kind of where we started this trial at. You can see some kind of faint layering down at the bottom here where we started the trial. And you can see the coring hole and you can see some of the sand on the surface. So this was spring. So we, we do have some thatch at the surface because we're not top dressing during the winter. Um, but by the time we get to probably august or september will have filled up this kind of canopy or this this thatch at the surface here so this is kind of our, our best case scenario after our three years of the trial uh, and then for comparison i've got a 
let's see, it's not, there we go. And then here's our solid tie in spring and fall at the highest uh, rate of sand. So once again, we're, we're diluting out this layer. There's a little bit attached to the surface. I didn't happen to catch a solid tine hole on this one, but uh, overall fairly good. And I've got a couple more here to compare. So this is our, our hollow tine spring and fall at the lower rate of sand. And the only difference is maybe a little bit more thatch at the surface or mat at the surface that has accumulated. And before I go to the nitrogen rate question what about you said you're measuring om246 on these what kind of om2 numbers do you get on on that non-treated control where we have two centimeters of thatch yeah is that, well is that 30 30 percent or something i haven't uh, i haven't worked through we're in the process of getting an oven so i haven't made it through all the samples yet and i've actually got a stockpile of about two thousand samples in the <laughs> minus 80 or minus uh, zero that are waiting to be to be ashed and so we're, we're getting a couple muffle furnaces in and we're going to do all of that in-house so i actually haven't run all of these organic matter samples yet nice yeah that yeah. that will be useful and i imagine you can offer that type of testing also for because uh, if you agree with me that that type of testing can be really useful as a way to quantify what's going on over time. Yeah, um, and uh, there's, there's some issues. So uh, and I've had some issues trying to get um, entire samples ashed, especially when you're taking larger samples, a lot of soils labs, and, and I'm sure you've discussed this, but when a soil lab gets a sample in, especially if you're doing a full soil test, they take that, that sample, they put it through a flail grinder, then they pass it through a two mil sieve, and then they just start taking scoops out to do analysis. So depending on how mixed, well mixed that sample is, or how much kind of verdure or green material they've they've siphoned off through that sieve, your organic matter numbers can be all over the place. So um, my recommendation is always to ash the entire sample so you don't have that kind of human error added in there from, from grinding it and separating it. So sample your organic matter sample separately from a nutrient analysis or soil pH and just exclusively sample um, for organic matter. So that's kind of what I've been recommended and, and I'm sure you're, or I, I should guess I should ask if you're along the same lines. Well, I think the soil organic matter that you get on a standard soil test is a valuable number because that's what we can use to predict mineralization. And that uh, is what the, the number that we'd use to look at uh, carbon sequestration in the soil uh, or, or to estimate how much uh, carbon there is in the soil if we're not going to measure the CN directly. Um, but for assessing the effect of cultivation, assessing the effect of changes in management practices, for assessing the effect of top dressing, uh, and and for that, you don't want the soil organic matter measurement. You want the total organic material measurement, which includes everything that typically gets screened off. And mm -hmm. so that's where the OM246, which is not a brand new method. It's the USGA is doing their research project to standardize it, but this is something that they've been doing in New Zealand uh, back probably into the 90s, I suppose. There was that 2005 article um, from the International Turfgrass Society Research Journal uh, from researchers in New Zealand who reported on what they found on, on a lot of grains in New Zealand using the OM246 method and it's also been done in the uk for 20 years or so and and i don't know i i'm going to talk to some of the people that were you know talk to keith mcauliffe and some of the uh alex glasgow and and uh get in touch with steve isaac or some of the people in the in the uk who would also know like when did all of this get started because now it starts to be uh it's something that i've been doing since 2017 and now the usga is doing their project on it but when did it really start who should really get credit for it is uh is something that uh i'm interested to know because it it just makes so much sense and I don't, i'm kicking myself people were telling me 15 years ago that i really needed to be looking at this and i it was just in one ear and out the other i was very aware of it and i just didn't see value in it and now i can't imagine trying to manage high quality 
golfing surfaces without having this number. Yeah, it's a, yeah, I have a really good slide. I didn't include it in here, but if you look at the last 30 years in, in organic matter research published, and you look at their sampling procedures and how they sample from organic matter, it's there's there's no standardized procedure for depth or diameter of sample or you know which region or zone of the soil profile to, to sample. It's it's all over the place, and so to have a standardized me standardized method that we can compare back and forth or across locations, I think will will be a big benefit and we'll be able to connect some of the dots that maybe we were kind of missing here in the past with, with doing so many different sampling procedures. So, Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Cause you look at you even, yeah, even your master's work, you look at that and you're like, okay, let me, let me figure out what method he used to measure that. And then you sort of guess what the numbers would be using yeah, and, a different and, method. In full disclosure, I would probably sample different now. Um, obviously and in this this conversation about organic matter but i would have sampled you know differently with those studies than i have now we just picked an arbitrary number to go with because that's kind of what what we had at the time um mm -hmm. and, and i think it worked and it, and it kind of got the message across or the point and kind of fueled some more research but um in hindsight you know it would it would be great to do that same study doing the the 246 method and and see what kind of results we get so um, well, yeah, that's how research goes. We, <laughs> that's how research goes. We, we learn and, and keep trying to do better. So yeah, it's good. Well, I have one more and then I'll let you ask about fertility here. Mm -hmm. One more slide. Um, so I did have, and I think I kind of skipped over this in the, the treatment design, but we did include top dressing only treatments. So we had both the low and the high rate here. And so here's our two cores of our top dressing only. So the, the center one is our 50 pounds per thousand and the, the right here is our hundred pounds. And so you can see some kind of distinct layering starting to form in here. Uh, and when we start talking about some of the infiltration rates in a minute here, uh, this, this layering is, is starting to cause some, some pretty big issues um, pretty quickly. So in by year three, we saw some pretty big decreases in, in infiltration with top dressing only treatments. So yeah, this is, um, I'm looking at those pictures and I'm seeing what Mark Hunt in the UK calls fiber. And I think maybe in, in, in the UK greenkeepers might, might call that type of material in the soil fiber. Um, and, and it does look like there's more of that in the top dressing only treatments than, than what you saw in, in the, uh, solid time or the hollow time. Mm -hmm. yep. all right so now do i get to ask uh why there's so much thatch and why there's so much fiber and what would happen if you cut the nitrogen rate by 25 percent or, or something like that yeah i think nitrogen rate obviously has some to do with that i think it's it's producing a lot of thatch i think the other thing that we see on research facilities is that we just don't get the wear and the traffic from from golfers so i think that has a bit, big impact on maybe stunting growth or just opening up the canopy or you know causing injury to slow down some growth and and we're kind of in optimum conditions here um, mostly controlled with fungicides any kind of diseases and we're we're growing pretty healthily um, so i i think that kind of difference in the amount of traffic and where we see has some contribution to it. And then, you know, we're not really right in that edge as low as we can be. I think we're probably three and a half to four pounds of nitrogen per year per thousand square feet. Um, I, so we're right around that 20 kilograms per hectare, I think is kind of the conversion per year. So mm -hmm. it, it's fairly high, but we are fertilizing a 10th or two tenths per month during the winter. So um, there, there's a fair amount that, that comes from that. So do you think, uh, like at some point when you go low with N, you're going to get anthracnose probably Correct. on pole yes. annua and yep. you're, you're above that threshold. And so when you talk about riding the edge, you mean you, you, maybe you could push it down a little bit lower, but, uh, with all your experience in this area, how, how much lower do you realistically think you could go without having, uh, anthracnose as a major problem? 
Um, yeah, I said that gets down to anything below three or even two and a half pounds. I think you're getting pretty low. Um, the, the most important time to fertilize is in spring and early summer to get out ahead of it, especially on the, the eastern seaboard where they see anthracnose fairly early. In Oregon, we, we typically don't see anthracnose till later in the summer, end of July, early August. So we have a little bit more of a buffer or a window to kind of build up nitrogen in the plant. Um, but yeah, where I see the most issues is where they're either really low on nitrogen or um, they get severe drought stress or have poor irrigation where they go into drought stress and then overwatering kind of back and forth. Uh, and then no kind of no top dressing program or no cultivation program. I see it kind of pop up in those areas as well. So those are kind of the, the big places where I see anthracnose. Well, th yeah, this is the, the results. The results of this experiment so far are pretty clear and you're going to continue it into 2024 and 2025 maybe. So we'll do a, a full set of data next year. And then we've got some ideas for how to kind of move this into the future. Um, and so we'll look at, um, I, we, we have kind of duplicate untreated checks in this trial. And so I have, you know, a full set of treatments or checks to work with. And I'd like to start coring those plots and see how long it takes to recover the infiltration rate and surface firmness. And so, you know, if you don't core for five years, can you core for two years and kind of bounce back or how long does that take? Um, and then looking at some of our, our solid time treatments and, you know, what happens if you put a hollow tine on that for a year, does your infiltration rate go back up? Um, and I can kind of move on. I've got a couple of um, slides on infiltration here. Um, yes, so this please. is our, our, our infiltration rates from last year. So this was taken September right before we cored in 2022. Um, and I'll put in the line here for the USGA recommendations. So that's that's for KSAT or the, the Laboratory of Saturated Conductivity. So it's, it's maybe not exactly our field infiltration, but it gives you kind of a guideline to shoot for. We have our infiltration rate over here and then all of our treatments along the bottom here. So on the far left, we have our untreated control and then our two top dressing only treatments. And so these were by far our slowest treatments. Um, I had one non-treated control this year that was less than a tenth of an inch per hour. So it was out there for five hours and less than a half an inch went into the ground. So some of these plots are, are not moving at all. Wherever we put uh, a hollow tine twice a year, we we're staying close to that six inches per hour. And last year when we were looking at the data, I probably would have said, you know, solid tines looking equal to the hollow tine. I don't see a big difference between the treatments. The one kind of dip down you can see here with our solid tine treatments, those were the fall solid tines. So it had been almost a year since we'd put a tine into these greens, but you're also seeing kind of that similar drop off for the hollow tine in the fall at the 50 pound rate as well. So this was, this was last September's data. Um, around that time i was telling everyone after three years we're not seeing a huge difference between our hollow tide and our solid time treatment but if the highest infiltration rate is your goal then hollow time both spring and fall and a high rate of sand top dressing is your best treatment so that it, was kind of recommendation go ahead well you finish finish your thought and then i'm well, gonna ask a question <laughs> okay so that that was uh you know if you, if you really need to improve infiltration or reduce organic matter, then, then that hollow tiny twice a year and a high rate of sand is going to be your best, your best bet. So in Western Oregon, in Corvallis, the ground is saturated uh, from when, whenever in the autumn, all the way through into, until the spring generally. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've got, let's say three or four months where it's sat the ground is saturated to begin with and then it rains and you so you're measuring the infiltration rate but do you actually notice a difference if you go out there on a rainy day on you know january 25th or something and it's and it's raining do you notice a difference on the plots like oh like yeah there's I... standing there's standing water on some and there's there's not standing water on others Yep, pretty much wherever I put a tide in the ground, there's no standing water and our, our controls will be the first one to pop up, the one that we haven't put sand or, or 
a, a time treatment on, I'll see those right away. But but our top dressing treatment only is also kind of pop up as, as ones that we'll see start to uh, get moisture at the surface and start to puddle. And, you know, eventually at some point, the whole green <laughs> sometimes floods, we get so much rain, but, but you can definitely pick out the, the poor infiltrating treatments. Definitely. That's interesting. That's interesting. You know, I, I, I do some consulting work at, at Kea golf club in Japan, which has zoysia greens and their, uh, they, went for three four five years without putting a hole in the greens no solid time no venting no hollow time no slicing of any or anything like that and and it rains pretty heavy there you know thunderstorms and 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 stuff like that and they they didn't see issues and i just wonder if it if there's something to do with the sand makeup and the the baseline um the 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 baseline infiltration rate or KSAT of the of the root zone sand or the top dressing sand that might have something to do with that, or if it's yeah. just only POA. Yeah, I think I mean you can see it in those photos. We we do build a lot of a lot of thatch at the surface, um, and, and so that could be part of it. I, I'm sure our infiltration rate wasn't tremendously high at the beginning. I have to look back at my numbers, but. I would say we we're probably that two to four range, maybe slightly higher before we started putting some of these more aggressive treatments on. Um, so some are slightly trending down and, and some of our better treatments are actually trending up. And I can show you this year's data. So this one's kind of hot off the press and the, the scale has changed a little bit here. So I'll go back to the previous one. Our max was 10 inches per hour and now we're up to 12 inches per hour. And so the, the, the cool part is now we have a couple treatments that are over that kind of six inches per hour uh, infiltration rate, both of our spring and fall hollow tines at both of the sand rates. And actually our hollow tine spring ones are kind of trending up that direction. Now, the unfortunate part is we're starting to see a slight decline in our solid tide treatments after the fourth year. So the, especially these kind of on the end, the, the spring and fall ones seem to be kind of, dropping off now and hmm. I, don't, I don't want to be too alarmist they're still infiltrating four inches per hour which is much better than the control down here that was at you know a tenth of an inch per hour or a quarter inch per hour so i mean there's a big magnitude and difference between those but eventually at some point if you're relying on solid tightening i i think you're going to see a decrease in infiltration over time whereas our hollow time treatments seem to be trending in an upward direction meaning we're getting more infiltration Great. Um, so, I mean, this is all good information. You know, we can get away with solid tining for a certain amount of time before we start to lose infiltration or start to decrease a little bit. And then we know that we can go back to a solid tide and we can start to gain some of that infiltration back. So if, if that's a big concern for you, um, you know, the hollow tide treatments will, will really help you improve and regain some of those infiltration rates. And, you know, four years out of these treatments twice a year, we're up to, you know, seven inches per hour of infiltration rate. So I think that's pretty promising. I'm yeah, sure a lot of people, and, and I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago that people were really not too happy to see the infiltration and the solid times kind of dropping off, but, but it's good information to have. It's good to know. And I can't tell you how many people that came up to me and said, man, we've been solid tiny for seven years and, and they still look great and they're great performing greens. And I think, that's great. You know, keep doing it. And if you notice a drop off, then you know what you have to do. You know, you have to switch back to a solid time and pull a core and you may have to do that for a couple of years to kind of get back to where you want to. And so it's, it's kind of a mix of these different treatments. Um, the other thing I should point out with our solid time treatments is I'm going to the same depth every time. And obviously we're putting a little sand at the surface, but you know, if, if we create this, you know, quote unquote plow pan or layer from going to the same, um, same depth every time, you know, I would, should be able to see it here. And that's kind of the goal of going to the same depth is what's the worst case scenario. If we do the same thing over and over again, Yeah, because so, you're not, you're not doing any deep time or anything like that. Correct. You're just, yeah. and, and that's what I hear from a lot of people is that, well, we, we never pull a core, but then every third year I bring in a deep time. Well, that's going to solve a lot of your issues there. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that helps a ton as long as you're on um, a pretty 
regular top dressing program. And I think it's really easy to get into the heat of summer and just say, well, I might get a little damage or I might get a little bruising. So I think I'm going to cut off. And, and I think some of James's research pointed out that you got to stay on those top dressing programs and it really does help with anthracnose. And, um, as long as you're not doing it at peak heat and really trying to brush it in, you really shouldn't see too much damage from top dressing in the heat. Um, you know, I've, I've top dressed on some pretty hot days and brushed them in two, dire two directions with our hand broom and, and haven't seen any damage. So, yeah. All right. Well, that, that's going to be fascinating when you get the, the total organic material data. Um, and when, when you get those data, you know how much sand you've put, you know how much nitrogen you've put. You're, you're not measuring clipping volume on these, are you? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not measuring clippings on that. I've got another another PGR growing degree day model that I collect clippings uh, at least three times a week all summer long. So, OK, so I've got enough but, clipping but collections. So that's I can imagine that's uh, it's tough to do on small plots, <laughs> but yeah. uh, I, it's going to be fascinating to just look at the change in organic material in the soil over time. And when you, um, you know, the amount of sand that's been applied. So if the grass was not growing and you add a certain amount of sand, you can calculate how that should reduce the organic matter measurement. But then it, when it, it, it won't reduce as much as you would calculate because the grass is growing and creating organic matter. So there's a organic, matter accumulation rate that you can calculate from that, which should be really interesting um, to see what that is at different sand rates and at different uh, cultivation rates. So, mm -hmm. or, or and, cultivation And how treatments. nitrogen rate ties in with that too, right? So we can look at- Well, but you've, you've got the fixed nitrogen rate, Yeah. but right. But how many times are you sampling for organic matter? It Once a year? Mm -hmm. I'm doing Twice. once a year so we can look at seasonal right if there's some difference in accumulation and so we can look at a lot of different factors temperature mm -hmm. you know a lot of environmental factors and, and nitrogen rate so yeah I, for, unfortunately there's a lot of things going into it so yeah it's it's a really cool study and uh maybe i can come see it in the spring when i visit oregon that would be cool um yeah that'd be awesome when we i you know i I look at this and I'm like, man, that, that, that it's so different from what I see people actually get results with on bent grass. Um, cause you can, let's say with bent grass, I've seen greens, which wouldn't be everywhere, but, but more than one location where they can top dress a couple times a year, you know, top dress in spring or autumn, not in the summer. So just a couple relatively heavy top dressings the total amount of sand that goes down is is like your low rate uh or or less than your low rate and not punch holes and the bent grass can still be fine and the organic matter doesn't go up and the nitrogen rate is uh 50 or or 40 percent of of what you're doing in this study so I, everything is is right climate specific grass specific soil specific the way it's managed specific but uh I want to think that the flexibility that green keepers have or golf course superintendents have, they've got a flexibility that you don't have when you're doing a research project because you design it and then you have to repeat the same treatment every time where they can adjust the rates. They can adjust the tines. They can, they can, they can skip treatments when they think it's, it's possible. Uh, they can reduce the nitrogen rate when they see the thatch start to accumulate and and I just, uh, I, I want to think that it's possible to get good POA greens, maybe not as, ex maybe not going to the extremes of, of what you, what you know, I've talked about or, or written about, or other people have shared about bank grass, but I want to think that with POA, we could put a little bit less in a little bit less, um, sand and yeah maybe yeah maybe still get good greens because i know i i know i don't know i i know jason haynes when he was on uh, uh, on the sunshine coast 
he was getting pretty good results without putting too much sand or punching too many holes. A couple guys on Vancouver Island. Uh, I, I don't know what they're doing up in the Seattle area. I don't know. You know how people are managing in that part of the world. But on golf courses, they might be putting less in and, and less sand and still getting good results. Or, or, think, or are they doing more? Well, it's, it's kind of a split. I think there's definitely, as you go up towards the Seattle area, I would say the majority of them are solid tiny twice a year. They'll probably top dress um, sp- spring and fall, but then they'll kind of cut out in the middle of summer. I think that's kind of pretty standard operating procedure. You see a mix of things in, in Oregon here. The really high-end tournament courses are – pulling a core twice a year and top dressing every two weeks at, at a pretty aggressive rate. Um, I'm good friends with Jim Meyer at Columbia Edgewater and, and they pull a core twice a year and they top dress every two weeks religiously throughout the summer. And they've got some of the best greens in, in Oregon here. Um, but that's, that's kind of the high end of the spectrum. And then you get kind of a mixture of solid time, hollow time, depending on your crew and, and members. And then a lot of it is, spring top dressing you get on a good schedule and then you get to the heat of summer and they kind of cut off till fall so that's that's a lot of what i see is kind of withholding the 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 top dressing during the summer which i've always tried to encourage to kind of stay on it i think james's work and actually john Inguijado before him showed really well that that sand top dressing is protecting the crown and as helping it with anthracnose and actually some of james hempling's research showed that uh, actually, you want to keep the nitrogen rate up, keep the top dressing rate up throughout the summer, and you can actually keep the mowing height lower to keep ball roll up and not get as much disease. So if it's, you know, one of the BMP factors that you want to kick out, it's it's actually mowing height that you can keep low if you stay on a heavy top dressing and, and a higher end rate program. So um, I, I found that pretty interesting. So so I've always been kind of of the mindset of to stay on that top dressing program um, through, throughout the summer. And I think that's where a lot of your surface firmness comes from, especially late in the season is those aggressive top dressing programs and staying on them. Um, I think when you get a little moisture and the greens get soft to the surface, uh, my inclination would be to remember to cut and top dress and, and, and stay on and those programs. I, 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 that's, that's definitely the standard way to do it. But then we hear these out, landish uh things like at royal melbourne where they just had the asian amateur championship i don't know if you had a chance to watch any of that but uh people can check out the asian amateur championship twitter feed or website they may have some archive uh and look at some of the ball reaction on the greens at royal melbourne golf club in australia and i had a chance to talk with the director of courses there uh, richard forsyth and he said they basically don't top dress maybe once a year now okay it's a different grass type it's uh it's it's primarily brown top bent grass or or colonial bent grass but uh, they must put zero nitrogen on (laughs) they they put more than i expected but but it's relatively low um but it's just it's shocking so they're using uh, you know, they'll get a clay, the, the 500 gram clay and get numbers from, you know, 130, 140, 150. When the President's Cup was there, uh, I think it was 150 or something. Um, mm-hmm. And it is just, it's just, I, I, I get to study turf grass around the world and see conditions around the world. And sometimes there's stuff like that. And then it just makes me question everything. Because I used to think that you, you'd get firmer grains by putting more sand and then sometimes you see people that don't put sand or or you saw the uh uh dan Danelli's video remember dan Danelli's youtube video where there he throws the ball down or one of the assistants there throws the ball down as hard as they can they're like here we've top dressed with sand and the ball goes plunk and make and it bounces up like you know four inches or something and it makes a big ball mark he's like here we top dressed with compost no sand and the ball bounces up and you can you know catch it about waist high or something and then you're like okay so i think sand and definitely all that rutgers research shows that sand on poa annua is uh, it seems to be essential with that type of management program 
and but then there's these other situations that I don't know. Would any of that work on poa, or is that only specific to bank grass, or or perhaps some other species? I think with poa, we just accumulate so much thatch in that upper inch. You know, if it just really accumulates, concentrated at that that upper layer in the surface, and so um, I think sand obviously is one way to to, to take care take care of that. But I think kind of the the sharper Turf managers here also realize that, you know, a graden or something aggressive verticutter taking that material at the surface also helps a ton. I've actually seen some pretty impressive uh, jumps in firmness from just double gradening and getting a lot of sand into that surface. Um, I, I just think it's acu accumulating so much more in the upper surface compared to creeping bent grass. It's probably much deeper rooting. Um, but if we, that would if be my guess. Uh, and your pictures show that it is accumulating. And then I guess the, that's where, for me, I think clipping volume has been really uh, interesting to find out how useful that is to really uh, check day after day what the growth rate is because it allows one to optimize that and, and hopefully minimize any unnecessary growth that could be contributing to thatch. And, and I know if you put zero nitrogen on poa annua greens growing in a sand root zone, I can expect the conditions will be shockingly bad. <laughs> and, and yet I want to think that maybe we can go lower with nitrogen than we thought. It's, and I'll use Hazeltine National Golf Club with bentgrass greens as an example. Just a couple years ago, they were putting two pounds, maybe 2.2 .2 pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet, which at that time I would have thought that's pretty low. I mean, or there was a time in my life where I thought that for the Minneapolis climate, for bentgrass in a sand root zone, maybe maybe three pounds would, you know, two and a half to three pounds would be about the number. Um, uh, and so that would be 12.5 to 15 grams or uh, 125 to 150 kilograms per hectare. Uh, so that, that, that's the number that would have been maybe five, 10 years ago. And, and, and that seemed kind of normal to me. And then, then they went a little bit lower and then, then they were doing like 1.6 pounds or 1.5 pounds. And this year, I think it was actually less than a pound. And I would have thought if you would have asked me five or 10 years ago, I would have said, oh, you can't, you can't manage bent grass on a, a course that gets really heavily played during this, the short growing season when it's open. You can't do that. You'll get anthracnose or the, it'll thin out. You'll get algae. There, there will be problems. And yet Chris Tritabal, the golf course superintendent is measuring the performance data and it's not those bad things. They haven't happened yet. Um, and I just have that kind of data from, from bent grass and I know I have some friends in, in Canada that are working with, uh, with, and yeah, some friends in the Pacific Northwest, also in the United States that are, are making some of these measurements of clipping volume and, and, uh, and playability and OM246 and stuff with, uh, with POA. And I don't, you know, they're not pushing it as low as they do with bent, but I just, I just wonder. I, I just wonder when I look at the results from your research from this current project that you're discussing it's crystal clear that, you know, even one cultivation event per year seems insufficient and top dressing only even at, at moderate rates is it's, it's a disaster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so you need to, you need to punch holes. You need to put sand in the holes. You need to do all these things. That's what the research is showing. Uh, I just, I, I think it'll be interesting five or 10 years from now to look at, at the people that have the ability to adjust on the fly in the field. If you can do things with POA, like some people are showing you can do with bent grass. Yep. Well, I think there was a time that we tried, I mean, in the late nineties, early two thousands, I think people were pushing the envelope of, of getting low on POA. You know, there, I've, I've heard stories of being around that that pound pound and a half of n on the eastern seaboard and that that's kind of when the anthracnose epidemic kicked in in the late 90s and so a little bit different with bent grass i think you can get away with that it's not as susceptible to 
um, to anthracnose and some of the newer cultivars are, are even more tolerant than, than Pencross and some of the older varieties. So I, I think that's another thing is that we're seeing the new varieties of, of creeping bentgrass are being bred at low, under low fertility. And so they look greener, look better at a pound, pound and a half of nitrogen. I think Stacy Bonos at Rutgers, her bentgrass greens, they get a pound or a pound of head, pound and a half of nitrogen per year. And then she's doing a lot of the selections of color and, and quality based on that. So the new generations of bent grasses coming out are all bred for low fertility. So I'm not surprised that the trend's kind of going that way with the bent grasses. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have a, a low nitrogen annual bluegrass cultivar yet. So we'll, yeah, we'll see if that hits the market. Yeah, I think... I think measuring the clipping volume can be really useful um, for, yeah, just for, for figuring out what low N is because, uh, you know, you hear people talk about low N or high N, but it really it's just in the context of how much you're making the grass grow. Yeah, I should have, I should have <laughs> a little bit of data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. I should have a little bit of data. We're doing some other uh, PGR trials and we have a couple different nitrogen rates in there and it's a, a newer sand based green. And so I'm not going ultra low, but we're going at some lower rate and, and a fairly high rate. Um, and we have quite a bit of checks without um, without nitrogen. So uh, I'm, I'm actually interested in, in, in looking at kind of some of the growth throughout the year and how much are we're yielding and, and compare back to some of your growth potential work. So. If I get some of that data, I'll, I'll have to share it with you. That's that's awesome. Well, you know what? We've gone over our planned time, and we didn't even get to talk about MLSN and potassium. So yeah. uh, we might have to do gonna, take two for potassium, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so so I'm going to invite you back uh, as soon as we can schedule it to talk about the. Good morning, Nora. I'm. Yeah, I'm I'm having a call with Chaz. You want to say hi? Okay. Say hi. Hello. Uh, all right. Now go back to bed, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Um <clears throat> that was Nora everybody. Um so yeah, let's let's talk again about potassium, but can do you have like 5 minutes just to 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 tease our listeners and viewers about what we're going to be talking about? Yeah, sure. So you did the the uh, the research on potassium effects on anthracnose, and then you discovered that low potassium also had worse winter kill, also on POA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we, we started some research. And it, it this actually all evolved. I won't say devolved, but it evolved out of some nitrogen source work we were doing. So we'd done a lot of our research on nitrogen rates, soluble rates on anthracnose using ammonium nitrate. Uh, and as a lot of people know, that's pretty difficult to get your hands on in the States. And so we started looking at different nitrogen sources and we got a lot of questions whether that mattered. Um, the nitrogen source study kind of led down a, a couple other wormholes looking at uh, potassium nutrition on annual bluegrass and anthracnose. We also started looking at some soil pH work and calcium nutrition and its effect on uh, annual bluegrass quality. Um, and I got a text message this morning um, from Jim Murphy asking when we're going to publish that uh, soil pH paper. But I, I believe we <laughs> are at over 10 years looking at uh, a broad range of soil pHs on annual bluegrass, all the way from, I think I got some down into the high fours, all the way up to the, to the mid sevens. And so we've got quite a bit of data on that that we'll trying to be putting together and publish as well. Um, and then the, the potassium work, of course, we we looked at potassium rates and potassium sources to look at um, how they affected anthracnose. And basically, we found kind of a threshold that you need to be over. Once you're over that threshold, no more potassium uh, improved things. So you just had to get above that level and maintain above that level. Um, and what level? And so, so that's the same type of language that I use when I'm talking about MLSN. And I say, uh, as long as you're at or above this level in the soil with potassium, then the grass is going to be supplied with enough. But the number that I was using was 37 parts per million, and you came out with a different number. What number did you come out with, and what, what do you recommend now uh, for um, the minimum number? 
Yep. So the the minimum number we we came up with was uh, I believe it was like forty four or forty three uh, parts per million, um, and so that that's kind of the the technical line through our data. I I go for the simple fifty, keep it above fifty, and then we we did some more analysis, and basically if you go over that. 85 parts per million, the plant's not able to take up any more in the leaf tissue. So going above that level, the plant's not even taking up and you're wasting it. So staying in that 50 to 80 range is really kind of what I suggest for annual bluegrass. Now that's annual bluegrass turf. Um, if I was managing bent grass, I would probably want to be on the lower range um, just okay. because I think it encourages annual bluegrass to grow in and fill in if you have higher potassium. So that's perfect. Well, that that's a topic that we're going to discuss next time. Um, and yeah, the pH, the calcium, that's interesting too, but maybe, uh, potassium will be the dominant, uh, one. Now you've, I'll put a link for people who haven't read it. I'll put a link to that paper, which is, uh, potassium nutrition affects anthracnose on annual bluegrass uh that's your agronomy journal article i think um but yep. I, I can put a link to that in the show notes um and, and we'll talk about why uh i think our recommendations might be equivalent or why they might be different uh the next time but i, I just want to ask you one question before we we close out this episode Let's say you've got a, uh, let's say Columbia Edgewater, the fine golf course where Jim Myers is the golf course superintendent in, in Portland and renowned for having great Poa annual greens. Let's say they build a new uh, practice green. And let's say that they sawed it with Poa annua. And let's say that you looked at the soil test and all of a sudden they had 25 parts per million potassium on a, on a Malik three test. And then what, uh, but, but it's a brand new sand green. So you're probably not going to be able to hold a lot of potassium in the soil. So for, for a POA annual green, what type of nitrogen to potassium ratio would you recommend to Jim in, in that type of scenario? Let, let's say for a one year period, let's say, let's say you did the soil test in autumn, 2023, and you're making a, a fertilizer recommendation for, for this winter going into 2024, what type of potassium amount in relation to nitrogen would you be recommending? Or will you say, well, let's try to get the soil up to 75? How, how would you do that? Yeah, I think what we found probably the most effective is just going out at low rate spoon feeding. And so I think our lowest rate in our potassium trial was just over um, – a pound of potassium elemental P per year. So if you spread that out over like 14 applications, you're putting out like 0.075 or just under a 10th every couple weeks. Um, and so that would kind of be my recommendation is start early, start in May or June, spoon feed it out through your summer program. And then, you know, I've, I've been kind of looking at some of Doug Soldat's work with the pink snow mold and some of the, the, the gray snow mold work. I think it, it's pretty clear that high rate applications or big surges of potassium late in the season are not good. So I, I don't think we should be putting these big slugs out in the fall to try to catch back up that I think it's just kind of metering out throughout the season is kind of the way to go at that. Um, and the rate, if it's two to one, three to one, four to one kind of ratio, I think that's, you know, probably more like that two to one end decay ratio is probably the, the, the ideal ratio for maintaining or trying to build up. And then I think once you get to a level where you're happy, you can back off a little bit and see what, what that does. Am I falling off or am I still kind of building my, my soil K and kind of adjust on the fly accordingly? So we've got a little bit of um, data from our trials where we weren't, uh, we basically had accumulated that low baseline of potassium in our soils with that slightly over a pound of K per year and just kind of held it at that level. So that's where that's kind of my default. If you're, if your soil K is good, then somewhere around a pound per year spoon fed throughout the season is probably what you want to do. Um, if you're really low, then, then bump out 
you know, a little bit higher to two pounds per year um, to kind of get you back up and then you can back down because I think pushing it um, higher, or, you know, putting more potassium down can have negative effects for other things. There's some, some new work coming out of Rutgers looking at dollar spot and potassium. So actually they're using some of my similar plots that we've accumulated these, these big differences in potassium levels. And they're seeing uh, an increase in, in dollar spot, I believe, seems to be an interaction between nitrogen and potassium, but at higher rates of nitrogen, they're seeing that higher rates of potassium cause more dollar spot. So we, we are starting to thread this needle here into a really tight range of potassium where we really don't want to go too high and we don't want to go too low. And so. and I think you can, you can look at how much the grass is using. And if you're just supplying the amount that the grass is using without starving it by going too low, without force feeding it by going too high, it, and it's just common sense, really, when you think about it, why don't we just apply things that match the growth rate that we want? And that's where I think like measuring the growth rate, which doesn't have to be done for every research project, but as a golf course superintendent, if you can measure the clipping volume, it turns out to be really useful because from that you can estimate how much nutrient you've harvested and you can just replace that if you want to. Or if you don't want to replace it and you've got a soil test and you know there's plenty in the soil, then you just let the grass use what's in the soil. So it a lot of this stuff just becomes common sense and and but we need to do the research to figure it out and then after you do the research it's like well that makes sense it's so simple <laughs> yeah yep. same thing with growing, pH. just growing just, grass <laughs> yeah yep, yeah exactly yeah and the more data we have you know the more you collect the the more informed decisions you can make so i'm a, i'm a big fan of taking as much data as you as you physically can can consume and do something with obviously if you if you can't analyze the data and make something of it it's, it's kind of worthless but you know clipping volume is an easy one that you can you can measure and 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 adjust on the fly based on that um same with growth potential it's a good way of deciding management practice for the day if they're gonna you know mow or roll or or both you know so mm -hmm. yep it's the more data the better yeah, as long as you can do something with it. All yeah, right, Jazz. Well, uh, that was a longer than usual episode, but it was fascinating talking with you. Thank you for sharing all of that information. Um, I'll put your. Do you, do you use Twitter? You, you yeah, use Twitter. I'm on Twitter. So yeah. So I'll put your Twitter link in the uh, in the show notes also. Um, and yeah, people can Google you and find out some of the fascinating and very practical research that that you've done. Uh, and yeah, it's awesome. So I, I really appreciate it. We're going to start scheduling our next episode <laughs> so we can really dig into that potassium issue. And uh, any, anything else before we go? Nope, that sounds great. I look forward to it. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching, for listening. And thanks, Chaz, for joining. And uh, I will say goodbye now. Thanks for listening for ATC from Bangkok. I'm Michael Woods. Bye-bye.